Hello, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Climate. I'm Jennifer Giordano, and today we're bringing you a special research episode. We'll be taking a look at part one and part two of our latest American Climate Perspective surveys titled, Are Americans Making the Climate and Health Connection? And Climate Change Sparks Emotional Responses. I'm joined by Nicole Hill, Eco America's Research and Marketing Manager, and Catherine Catalano, the Deputy Director of American Public Health Association's Center for Climate, Health, and Equity. The two co authored the report alongside Eco America Executive Director Megan Spicer. Let's kick off this episode with a few questions before diving into the findings. Nicole, can you give some context to this report? Why did EcoAmerica and APHA launch this survey? Hi, Jennifer and Catherine. Yes, I can. I just want to say thank you so much um, and thanks to everyone watching for joining today. Before I get into it, I also want to take a moment to recognize that I'm speaking today while in the territory of Huchin and the land of the Muekma Ohlone people who stewarded this land for generations. To answer your question, we launched this survey as part of both National Public Health Week and Mental Health Awareness Month, which were back in May of 2022. And it's important um, for our work in building public support and political resolve for climate solutions to understand if people are making that connection between their own health and the climatic changes and climate impacts around them or also around their families, friends, and loved ones. Similarly, it's really important to know how U.S. adults are feeling about climate change when they think about it. Coming out of this pandemic, mental health is really on the forefront of people's minds. And so in light of that, um, and in light of Eco Americas and the American Psychological Association's new mental health and our changing climate report, we wanted to better understand those points um, with some additional questions in the survey about benefits of action and others. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, mental health is being recognized as an impact of climate change. Recently, the World Health Organization has even released a policy statement on mental health and climate change. Catherine, would you tell us a bit about APHA's involvement in the issue and the work the Center for Climate Health and Equity is taking on? Absolutely, Jennifer. And thank you for having me on today. Our center's work on this issue is really focused on two things raising the visibility of climate change's effects on mental health so that it is a more central part of the conversations around climate resilience, and spotlighting the need for and helping to enable public health solutions to issues of mental health and wellness. Climate change is a population level trauma. It's something we're all experiencing together. And this is true whether you're talking about a community that experiences a natural disaster together, or whether you're talking about the more general climate anxiety that is being experienced across the world especially by young people who are worried about what their future will hold and whether they'll have any power to shape it. For this kind of trauma that is felt so broadly, relying on the traditional methods of mental health treatment and the provider-patient relationship is just not going to cut it. We need to not only think about treatment at the broader community level, but also wellness and prevention that comes from building a community of support, from engaging people in solutions designed by and for them, to support groups, to all sorts of other solutions that are actually already being developed by community level organizations out there in the world, um, testing out ways to approach this issue. And we need to dedicate more resources to supporting and expanding that work and to training the public health workforce to carry out these kinds of solutions. This is especially important when you think about all of the different population level traumas people are experiencing right now that are compounding on one another. Climate trauma doesn't exist in a vacuum. We're also suffering from the collective trauma of COVID-19, for one example. Many are dealing with the added trauma of things like poverty and race-based violence and discrimination. There just aren't enough therapists out there to deal with the mental health effects of all of these issues, and we need to be more proactive about addressing them. Awareness is the first step, so I'm excited to dig into these survey results around the dangers of climate change and the resulting emotional responses of the American public to help start building that awareness. Thank you, Catherine. It's inspiring to hear what APHA is doing to bring awareness to the urgent issues regarding climate, health, and equity. Nicole, let's take a look at the survey. Great. Let me pull up the results. 
Okay, so the methodology, the top lines, and the full report can be found on EcoAmerica's website, and they're also going to be linked in the video description below. This report was fielded on April on April 15th, 2022, and it yielded 1,066 adult respondents. Um, and it used the Census Bureau's in American Community Survey to weigh the national general population and reflect the demographic composition of the United States. Respondents were asked for information on their sex, race, ethnicity, age, state, and education level, so SurveyMonkey could weigh the results to be nationally representative. I also want to note that in interpreting the survey results, all sample surveys are subject to possible sampling error. Um, so the margin of error for this sample is plus or minus 3%. And now I can dig into the findings. What this first graph shows is the percentage of US adults who say the following impacts make them concerned for their health and safety. You can see that 59% say that air pollution makes them concerned. 50% say severe storms make them concerned, followed by 47% who say disease carrying insects and so on. Even 33% um, say that floods make them concerned for their health and safety. What's a commonality between all of these is that they're all impacts of our changing climate. We know that air pollution is a serious component of climate change and severe storms are becoming more frequent and stronger, which some people who are watching this episode may have already experienced um, earlier in the summer. In this next graph, we asked about the same impacts, but we asked the respondents, which of these do you associate with climate change? And this is interesting because 61% of US adults say that they associate heat waves with climate change. But as we saw on the last graph, only about 37% said that heat waves made them concerned for their health and safety. On the flip side, air pollution concerned a lot of respondents, but less than half, you can see here 46%, say that air pollution is associated with climate change. Catherine, perhaps can you provide some insight on what these results mean for public health? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll say that my main takeaway from these results is that we've got more work to do when it comes to communicating about the public health impacts of climate change. Um, Americans seem to have the most understanding around the dangers and climate related impacts of severe storms. And that makes sense. Um, but if you go back to the last slide, if possible, what was surprising to me, um, here we are, yeah. What was surprising to me was that severe storms came in at such a high level of concern at 50, while floods sat at the bottom of the list with only 33% of people concerned. Extreme weather events like hurricanes and other severe storms lead to flooding, which itself leads to road closures, major infrastructure damage, damage to personal property, risk of drowning, and increased waterborne diseases and mold contamination. I mean, but the storms higher on the list are concentrated incidents that are highly publicized year after year, so it does make sense that they're on people's minds. But while flooding um, is an extremely deadly climate impact, it's actually the second deadliest weather-related climate hazard in the U.S., with extreme heat taking the number one spot and getting more and more dangerous as time goes on and the climate crisis intensifies. From 2004 to 2018, there was an average of 702 heat-related deaths per year in the U.S., but in 2021, the Pacific Northwest saw an estimated 600 deaths in one week. Exposure to extreme heat can lead to heat stroke, and it exacerbates respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and renal disease, especially in populations that are particularly vulnerable. And when we talk about vulnerability to heat, to any climate impacts, really, um, we're either talking about whether that's due to inherent vulnerability, like for children, older adults, and people with disabilities or pre-existing conditions, or those who are vulnerable due to a history of dis disinvestment and exclusion from policy decisions. That includes lower income people, outdoor workers, incarcerated people, people of color, and those from historically redlined communities. It seems the American people see the link between heat waves and climate change, as you can see on this slide, but we really need to do more to communicate the true dangers of extreme heat. On the flip side, um, as you mentioned, Nicole, some areas we see here as an opportunity for more education on the climate change connection, um, things like air pollution and the increased spread of disease carrying insects. Both cause a significant amount of concern, but their links to climate change are less broadly understood. 
This is likely because they're sort of secondary impacts that need a bit more explanation. It's those increased temperatures that result from climate change that in turn cause more ground level ozone to form, which is also known as smog. This happens particularly in cities and can exacerbate and even cause a host of respiratory issues. Higher temperatures have also led to larger geographic ranges and longer warm seasons for disease carrying insects like fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes to thrive in. All of this is to say some of these connections aren't quite as obvious to folks. And the more we can educate people about the various health impacts of climate change, the more likely they'll be to take action. That's exactly right. Thanks, Catherine. People are concerned about these issues, but they're not connecting it to climate change. This points to educational opportunities and the need for increased disaster preparedness efforts. Now let's get to the findings in the second part of this report focused on emotions and solutions. Nicole, what are some of the main findings? So I'll start with feelings um, that U.S. adults identify with when they think about climate change. We asked our sample, when you think about climate change, how do you feel? And surprisingly, 60% of them said that they feel curious, including 24% who said that they feel very curious, and 36% who said that they feel somewhat curious. Following that, 57% of them said that they feel fearful, 56% said that they feel anxious, and 55% said that they feel angry. Only 32% of the respondents said that they report feeling optimistic when they hear about climate change. The finding, show, the finding that shows that 60% of adults are curious is a real call to action to talk about climate change with our friends, talk about it with our family and colleagues. We should really be talking about it with everyone every day. And the conversation can focus on solutions and the benefits of taking action. For example, if you called your representative or if you, um, wrote a letter to the editor, you should tell people about it. Tell them what inspired you to do it. Tell them what you wrote about. Um, people are really curious and they might want to join you in that conversation. And then also the fact that just about um, one third of people so that they feel optimistic is a real reminder that we have a lot of work to do. Catherine, what do you think? Yeah, so unlike in part one, most of these findings actually didn't surprise me at all. While it's disheartening to see that low level of optimism for the future is in line with what we've been seeing in regards to the eco anxiety that I mentioned earlier. And it serves as another reminder of how important it is to address the broad mental health impacts of the climate crisis. We know this is especially acute in those of us involved in climate advocacy who are fighting this fight every day, but it's important to see that this is also a trend across the general population in the United States. There's dire news coming from scientists and health experts every day. And that goal that was set in the Paris Agreement of limiting global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius is looking less likely, with experts now saying we're likely to hit that in the next five years. It's sobering information to be faced with, especially as more and more people are personally experiencing the health impacts of climate change. Whether that's food insecurity from drought, aggravated asthma symptoms from worsening air quality, or a concern for their safety in the wake of severe storms, wildfires, and heat waves. It's no wonder Americans are feeling fearful, anxious, and angry. I absolutely agree with you, Nicole, that these results present a call to action. We need to work together to communicate with this amazing 60% of Americans that are curious about climate change so that we can all work together to channel that anger and fear into action to build power for the movement towards climate justice and strengthen feelings of hope for the future. Thanks for further explaining that, Catherine. It's important to understand how each of these findings relates to public health and action on climate change. We know that concern is an important ingredient to proactive response. So turning that anger and fear into action is something that we can absolutely do. What about by age group? I know young people are really driving the movement. What are some of those variances by age? Great point, Jennifer. Uh, yes, there's no question that young people are organizing powerfully to move climate action forward. Compared to the national average um, and older adults, more young Americans between 18 years of age and 29 years feel curious, angry, fearful, and anxious when they think about climate change, and fewer of them feel optimistic. 
The gap is as wide as 16 points when comparing the 66% of young, younger Americans feeling angry to the 50% of Americans who are over the age of 60. And there's really no question why young people feel angry. They're standing to inherit a world right now afflicted by climate change and face the impacts for more years of their life should the trajectory of inaction persist. I absolutely agree, Nicole. And, and you see so many incredible youth climate activists out there organizing their communities and educating people on climate and health impacts and taking to the streets to demand justice. Mm -hmm. They're doing the work. And as you said, they're leading this movement, you know, which is a real shame because they're not the people in this country with the, the power. Those who are in the seats of power should really be leading this work. And these young people out there fighting and they're not being listened to. So of course, there's an incredible amount of frustration that comes with that. Uh, their continued fight provides so much optimism and inspiration for those of us that have been engaged on these issues for longer, but it takes a toll on their mental health as well when they're literally fighting for their future. And many are battling injustice on several different fronts right now. We need to do whatever we can to help build power for the youth climate movement and support their leadership. Yeah, absolutely. And there is lots that we can do to support the youth climate movement, whether it's through financial support or providing material resources. Lots of youth climate groups and youth climate leaders are really specific in their asks. So it's easy to support them by just listening to what they're asking for and showing up for them. Um, I'm heading to our final graph. So this one here shows that parents recognize the benefit that climate action has on health in particular. Um, when asked how it would affect their health if the United States took action on climate change, 63% of the overall survey respondents said that it would benefit. Um, this includes 31% who said that it would benefit their health a lot and 32% who said that it would benefit their health a little. Compared to the general public, however, more parents appear to be making that connection with health and solutions. Nearly three quarters, you can see here 74% of parents say that US action on climate change would benefit their health. That's 11 points more than the national average. This includes 37% who said that it would benefit their health a lot and 36% who said it would benefit their health a little. So these findings show that parents are really well positioned to participate and to lead in climate advocacy and action um, and in building support for climate solutions. Yeah, and similar to young people who are more concerned about climate change's effects on their future, parents seem to be quite aware that the decisions made on climate policy today will affect their health and that of their families for decades to come. We've mentioned several times today that the greatest value of these survey results is that they provide a call to action for parents, for public health professionals, for advocates of all ages and backgrounds who wanna strengthen the climate movement and help build momentum for equitable solutions. So we wanna make sure that we leave uh, you listeners, viewers, um, with some things that you can do to put these findings to work and make a difference. Yes, thank you, Catherine. So one thing you can do is communicate the health risks of climate change to your family, to your colleagues, your communities, and your representatives. As we already mentioned, talking about climate change is one of the best things that we can do, which um, I'll credit Catherine Hayhoe, who is a climate scientist, author, and public speaker um, with. She always advocates for this. She actually joined us for the American Climate Leadership Summit in March and really focused her presentation on the idea that the conversation can focus on the impacts that are in your community um, that, you know, relate to the people that you're conversing with. Um, and also focus the conversation on tangible solutions that are within reach and that, um, again, relate to the people you're talking with. You can find that common ground and go from there. You can also bolster preparedness efforts. Uh, the reality is that climate change is worsening things like heat waves, like air pollution, severe storms, and all the impacts that we've listed in these graphs. So making sure that you're prepared is one step that you can take to protect your own health. And then finally, these findings support the existing research that climate change sparks emotional response and can have harmful impacts on our mental health. So if you work in local government, um, try to incorporate mental health into your climate resiliency plans. You can also advocate for mental health to be included in community planning as well.
Yeah, and I'll just add that uh, if you don't work in local government, uh, you can still support strong local climate policy in your area. There isn't one single solution that will save us from the climate crisis. It's going to take policies at all levels of government across all sectors of the economy, from policies that support new technologies and emissions reduction solutions to those that support the emerging green economy to regulations that keep emissions in check to adaptation and resilience efforts that work to address health harms. This breadth of available solutions is why many cities, counties, and states um, have written and are implementing climate action plans. So they can examine all available solutions in one place and evaluate how to best reach their climate goals. Find out how you can engage on these plans and engage with government officials to ensure that the plans are comprehensive, ambitious, and equitable. Follow the lead of frontline communities who are experiencing the greatest burdens of the climate crisis and make sure they're centered and meaningfully involved in finding solutions. And don't forget to support one another in this hard and emotionally taxing work to build a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you, Nicole. This survey shows that people are concerned. It's clear with these findings and especially after the Supreme Court ruling that now is the time for climate action. We encourage you to go to ecoamerica.org to download the full report and social toolkit. Please join us in sharing these findings with your network. Let us know if you have feedback on this episode or ideas about uh, future topics. We're at research at ecoamerica.org and join us every Thursday for live episodes of Let's Talk Climate. Engage with us using the hashtag Let's Talk Climate, subscribe and uh, follow at ecoamerica on social for the latest research and resources on climate action and advocacy. Our next episode on July 14th is titled, You Can Do This, Replicable Models for Local Climate Action. See you then.